I've wanted to talk to a doctor for the longest time to understand like the difference in the way that we are taught growing up about nutrition and health and the realities I've come to learn about well where my poor health was coming from. And I now have the opportunity, today we're going to talk to Dr. Hampton, who's a board-certified family and obesity specialist with additional training in nutrition and functional medicine. He's passionate about removing barriers to health and equipping patients and his colleagues with the education and resources they need for success. He leads many programs in his health system, including healthy living programs, uh, the Family Pharmacy Diabetes Prevention Program, and COPD programs. He's authored the book, Fix Your Diet, Fix Your Diabetes and he's an active blogger on social media. He creates educational videos on YouTube and has a podcast system ranked in the top 1% called Protecting Your Nest, N-E-S-T, with Dr. Pony Hampton. I'm so happy that you're here. And I seriously want to start with you talking about how did you get into this? Yes, yes. It's a lot um, when you're in a... I'm at Advocate Aurora Health. That's in uh, Illinois, Wisconsin. Uh, Georgia, Alabama, North and South Carolina. So we're in six states. That's only in the last year that we've added Atrium, which was in the Southern states. And um, so I'm really passionate about not only helping patients and my family, but you know, health systems to think outside the box. And it started with my wife, who um, was uh, she's a pharmacist, and she was diagnosed with type one diabetes, she had gestational diabetes. And we knew with that, that her risk would be higher, but I don't know if we took it very seriously that she had about a 50% chance of becoming diabetic. We were really shocked when it was type one. And so as I started my journey with her, uh, she was um, very interested in having the type of control that would prevent chronic medical uh, conditions, uh, rather it's, you know, um, diabetic retinopathy, kidney failure, amputations, heart stroke. She didn't want any of those things. And I, and I learned as I started my research for my book and as I started to, you know, share this information publicly that in order to have the kind of control you want, you can't do it with medicine alone. Now, if type 1 diabetic has to take insulin, right? But the question is, how does a type 1 diabetic have normal blood sugars without being on a roller coaster? And if you only, if you consume what you want, which may spike your sugar and then chase it with insulin, you're going to probably not hit the target because it's a moving target. You may see 20 grams of carbs on a label, but they are allowed to be off by 20%. So it could be 16 carbs or 24 carbs. You're, then you're going to chase that with insulin with one manufacturer having insulin that works a certain way in your body and another working another. So now you have insulin that can be off. You can have the label not being exactly what it should be. So, which means that you may end up hyperglycemic or hypoglycemic and you're chasing your tail. Well, a better approach in a person who has to take medicine is to reduce the spike. And you do that by eating the foods that don't cause the spikes. That would be a low carb diet, keto, et cetera. And you may need less insulin, even if the insulin's not perfectly matching that number that you assume is correct. So now, that, that up and down blood sugar becomes a narrow up and down. Now you have the potential with diet and with medicine to not just have the ADA, American Diabetes Association's recommendation of a 7A1C, which is the three-month measurement of what your blood glucose has been on your red blood cells. Now you have the potential to have a uh, A1C that's 5.1, 5.2, less than 5.6 is a go. Because if you don't have an A1C or a blood sugar that's normal, you will eventually succumb to the complications of diabetes. So we need to change the paradigm from one where instead of saying 
a seven is okay for a diabetic, how about if we say a normal is okay for a diabetic? And if even if you're a type one diabetic or a type two on insulin, even with insulin as part of your journey, you can still achieve that, but you have to reduce what we call glycemic variability, meaning that the, the variability is not wide, but narrow. And that's the secret. That's what Dr. Bernstein was able to do, who wrote the Diabetes Solution. That's what Type 1 Grit Facebook group does, which helps Type 1 diabetics achieve good control. And that's what my wife's doing so that I can have my wife with me when I get old and I'm with my walker. <laughs> I want her to still be with me because she hasn't succumbed to uh, the complications. So that's kind of one of my whys is I want to make sure I have a wife that's still here. And I also want to help as many people hear this message so that they can achieve metabolic health as well. Wow. What you just said made me think of something that so you said that the variability on a package could be 20%. Yeah. So if I'm understanding that well, when we're eating packaged foods and they say whatever number, 20, 30, 40 per serving, you're saying we should be thinking maybe 20% more. Right, or 20% less. Well, the 20% less doesn't scare me as much as the 20% more, though, because that's right. what's going to harm us, right? Well, both will, because if it's 20, if it's 16 carbs instead of 20, I'm going to, if I give myself too much insulin, now I'm hypoglycemic. I have a lot of people who watch this show that are trying to just solve their issue without medication. That's, that's their ultimate goal. Yes. But what I just understood from you is that I might be looking at my numbers and not and struggling to understand why do I feel like I'm never in ketosis and part of the problem might be if I'm eating packaged foods and those packaged foods are telling me that you know this one was this one was 5 this one was 4 this one was 3 but if that's I right. add 20% to those numbers all of a sudden I'm over my 20 that's a, that's exactly correct and that's why there's so many variables even if you think about keto foods that are supposedly okay, you have to, now you have to factor in what we just described. Oh, by the way, we can subtract the fiber and the sugar alcohols. And we already know that some of the sugar alcohols will be absorbed. So there's all these variables that we lose control of. So why not instead, if I eat a serving of um, spinach, it's probably going to be a couple of carbs, right? So so in that scenario, I'm, all, so I'm already eating something that's lower in carbs because even that estimate is, I mean, what's a, who really just measures a cup of spinach, right? And gets it perfectly right. But if it's only two carbs, there's not, I mean, I'm probably going to land in a pretty good spot. Okay, maybe it's one and a half carbs, maybe it's two and a half, but that's not going to get me in trouble. What's going to get me in trouble is that banana that's 28 carbs. And so now I'm going to have to deal with that spike that comes from eating that banana and is it a medium banana? Is it a ripe banana? All of those factors affect how is it prepared if it's not just, I mean, maybe it's being cooked with something. So what we have to do is understand all of these factors matter. Our job is to simplify this journey. If we're a wellness warrior, as you, you would describe, how can I make my life easier so that I'm not on a roller coaster? Because if I'm on a roller coaster, it's going to impact how I interact with my family. My mood's going to be a little off. I come home. I've already had a long day. And now because my sugar's all over the place, it may, I may not interact with my spouse or my kids the way I should. So the impact is like that butterfly effect. And my job is to minimize the impact. So at the end of the day, because my sugars weren't all over the place, I have something left in the tank. And I don't have this irritable, this, this hangry, hungry and angry thing going because my sugar's all over. I just want to be stable and level. So as I face the challenges in my life, I can face them with a clear mind, with mental, I can focus. I'm not irritable. And I think that's the place I want. That's one of the biggest advantages of taking this carb-restricted journey is that there's, there's this level. I just feel level. And people say, man, you're always calm. And I'm not sure, even when I was not feeling calm, I would probably, you know, give that to the world. But it's nice that the inside of me is calm. And I, and that's why I can run to work and be this happy guy and, and bring that to my teams because 
my diet is okay. So, and it's just one part of it, but I think the diet is one of the most important. So you just used the word restricted, carb restricted journey, or, or and I wonder, like coming from the medical side of this. Yes. Is it actually restricted? If you think about, like in my mind, I question that because how humans should be eating versus how humans have been eating. Like, do you really, do you believe it's restricted or are we going back to what we should have been doing all along? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm definitely a fan of uh, Professor Tim Noakes and others who teach us that uh, hunters and gatherers are a better reflection of uh, who we are. I think there are cultures that tolerate more carbs than others, but when I listen to my body, my body says, you are a hunter and gatherer. You need to stop eating so often. And when you do eat, you need to prioritize the essential foods, essential amino acids, protein, essential fats, because there's no essential carbs. So when I eat that way, don't eat as often, and I eat the essential foods, I probably will end up restricting carbs because I they're not essential. So if they're not essential, then it's not really restricting. It's more, I'm just eating what my body needs. And so I think that's a fair comment that we need to be careful how we think about these terms, this language. And I do believe that you're right. Um, I, I just want to eat what my body needs to function. And as I've taken classes, getting the, gotten a master's in nutrition, I realized I need protein and fat to live. I'm, a, I'm just like the Eskimo who doesn't really eat fruits and vegetables. Just give me fish or give me the steak and I'm happy. And, and, I, and my body has rewarded me. And it's so nice to know that my body doesn't have to deal with irritable bowel anymore. It feel it feels it felt normal to feel an upset stomach, a crampy stomach. Now it feels normal not to. And I want that to be normal for more people. So that was your story, actually. Is yes. that by helping your wife, you actually ended up solving your issue. So can How we talk magical. a little bit about where you came from? Because that that to me was yeah. quite interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. It's uh so I started my journey. Um trying to help my kids. So I, you have your beautiful kids. They're 23 and 25, Justin and Brandon. And I remember getting a book, How to Disease Proof Your Kids. I think it was Joe Furman, I think. And it was plant-based. So I'm really trying to be a good dad. And I, so I started that journey. Now, compared to the standard American diet, I think we all benefited from eating real whole foods that were plant-based. But what, what happened for me personally is I still felt gassy. I would still have bouts of irritable bowel. It just wasn't as often. And then uh, as I started my journey to help my wife, I said, I'm going to write a plant-based diet book for diabetes. So Fix Your Diet, Fix Your Diabetes was going to be plant-based. Then I looked at the research and it said, huh, this A to Z study where they compared the Ornish diet, um, they compared uh, Atkins and some American diets as well. I was like, why is the Atkins diet giving better outcomes? And then I looked at more and more studies. I was like, oh my God, all the studies are showing better outcomes for low carb. I couldn't believe it. So I shifted to low carb in that moment. I didn't. I did it because I wanted to honor the science and because I wanted to help my wife and my patients. But as you have suggested, all of a sudden, and I did start with pro, probiotics were very helpful too. But whenever I would stop the probiotics, I would feel the symptoms come right back. When I started low carb, and I'm closer to carnivore now, I the symptoms just went away. It was like magical. So all of a sudden, if I ate a steak, I feel nothing. If I ate a steak with asparagus, I had to be careful. Now, the good news is there are plants that I tolerate. I, do, I don't tolerate Brussels sprouts. I tolerate greens. So what you do is you listen to your body. And when I'm not being a carnivore and I'm being a ketovore, where it's less than 10 carbs per day, I know which vegetables I can tolerate. 
so the goal is to understand what your body needs, be aware of nutrients that are in or things that are in plants, like the, the you know, they call them the anti-nutrients, the oxalates and phytates and lectins. There are things in plants that are used to protect the plants. And for some people, it's a good thing because they have hor hormesis, which is you're going to be challenged and it's going to make you, it's just like lifting weights. It makes you stronger because you've been challenged. For some people, that little challenge is going to be a disaster. And what I found is that if I'm challenged by the plants, the things in plants that are trying to protect the plant, and it harms me, then I don't need to be stronger from a plant. I need to avoid that because to my body is a toxin. To other people, it makes their body stronger. So I think everybody has to find their, you know, where on the spectrum from vegan to carnivore, you're going to live to be healthy. But for most people, at least in America, 7% are metabolically healthy based on Tufts University's research. So if that's true, that only 7% of us are metabolically healthy and metabolic health, where we, we were talking about your blood pressure, your blood sugar, your triglycerides, your HDL, and your belly are all in a, what we consider the normal range. If you're metabolically healthy, you can tolerate more things than a person who's not. But if most people are not metabolically healthy, and, and the best way to fix that is through lifestyle, reducing insulin spikes, hyperinsulinemia, making too much insulin, and you make too much insulin because you're eating the potato, the rice, the pasta, the corn, the bread, then it would be logical then to say to people, you don't really need carbs to live. If you eat fat and protein, you'll be fine. How about we reduce the carbs You'll still get all your essential nutrients from the protein and fat. And then you find that place, rather it's 20 carbs, zero carbs, 100 carbs, where you can thrive. And I think that's what I tell patients to do. Although I'm a low-carb doc, I always meet people where they are. So I have vegans in my practice, and I have carnivores in my practice. And I have vegans who don't do well with meat, and I have carnivores who cannot eat plants. So I think everybody, that, that's the world we want to live in. We want to live in a world where we honor each other's dietary approach while recognizing that for most people, based on the science, they'll do much better by reducing the carbs. I definitely think that we've been raised to believe certain things. And it's mm. hard, right? Because I, I also, I mean, I think back to myself, in different points in my life, stress and food impacted me differently. So in my earlier life, when I was stressed, couldn't get a piece of food in me. Mm. And then interestingly enough, when I became an adult and was actually able to control my own food, when I'm stressed, I eat. Mm -hmm. So there's a weird thing that I think also happens where there's mindset, there's a belief systems around things we've been we've been taught by our parents and society that also impact what happens to us when we're upset and then we're put in front of food. And I feel like that also it, and that's not like I when I was young I didn't not want to eat because I was hungry, but I was stressed and it just wouldn't go in. The same way that when I was older and I knew that eating what I was eating wasn't helping me, and I didn't want to eat it, but still somehow it was going in. I feel like we need to also understand that there's more to how my body reacts and just like the mind is in there somehow. It's doing stuff <laughs> that we don't really fully understand sometimes. And we'll get better as we take this journey uh, together. Conversations like this will maybe help somebody who doesn't eat the best diet. It's not a whole food diet. And then they'll say, and then you'll teach them about the importance of your gut health to make sure your serotonin level is okay. Because there are still people who don't know that a lot of the hormones like serotonin are made in your gut. So if you eat a diet where your gut won't be healthy, then your mood won't be healthy. So I just think people need to have those nuggets of information. And then we have to understand, um, my, mom, my mom loves me. Shout out to my mom, right? Her name is Annie Sharp. 
last name's different because she got married, right? And she will put food in front of me that is made with love. But she's also learned that if I eat her high starch dressing, which is delicious, by the way, my gut can't tolerate that. Because if I eat it Thanksgiving at 5 p.m., at some point at 1 or 2 in the morning, I'm in the bathroom. And so now, because she loves her baby, I'm still her baby. <laughs> uh, let's keep it real. She now knows that if I'm having my son and his family to at the house, I need to make sure there's some greens. There's some string beans. And she knows I'm, I'm, I'm an animal-based guy. I need to make sure all those animals she's cooking are not covered with Sweet Baby Ray barbecue sauce, right? And so there, so we've kind of worked around that as a family. Uh, and sometimes is what you do. Sometimes you bring those sides to a family's home because you know that's not what they do. So you say, I'm going to bring this and you're going to call, make sure some of the meat doesn't have barbecue sauce and you work around it. So I think there are so many factors that determine our path. Some of it is culture. Some of it is how we use food for love. And, and those food tend to be the things that can harm us the most. So we'll get there, but we just have to make sure we're honest with ourselves and with our families. Because if we're going to be on a journey to healing, it's really a team sport. And we need everybody to participate because they all want you to be here uh, for, for as long as possible but we need to be on the same page so that we're all kind of working as a family to achieve those goals. I definitely feel that that's a testament to like conversations matter, right? Like everybody needs to be sharing the information and you're right. Like our family wants us to feel good. They don't invite us over. So that we're going to eat their junk food, <laughs> right? Or, you know, like they made their, those special cookies. You, and if you don't eat them, they're not going to cry. But I feel like what we need to be able to do is talk about where we are. And mm -hmm. I feel like sometimes we're embarrassed to say that we can't eat those things anymore. Yeah. So I, I feel like one of the things I want you to, to maybe help me understand is how, how do we talk to our doctor or mm -hmm. our, like, I, cause I feel like our family is going to do whatever we want them to do because they love us. Then you walk into your doctor's office and so I actually have some questions from subscribers. And mm -hmm. one of the questions that I got was from someone who had changed their diet, right? Mm -hmm. So they, were, they had success doing keto. And the doctor said that their cholesterol had gone up and the pr mm -hmm. their pr uh, blood pressure had gone up. But they didn't feel comfortable to tell the doctor that they, they're doing keto. Mm -hmm. And so there's two questions first is that, did doing keto make their cholesterol and blood pressure go up? But second of all, like how can they have that conversation with their doctor? I'll start with the doctor conversation. So for me, um, I think the relationships we have with our clinician should be collaborative. I remember uh, in the United States, they got Dave Ramsey and he's like the you get out of debt guy and he has YouTube videos and things, right? Um, the goal is to partner and I'm not right. You're not right. We're both doing this together. So the first part is I do pay you. I pay Dave Ramsey, for example, to give me financial advice, but he it's really more of a advice is guidance. It's not telling you what to do. Here's, here's what I think you should consider. And then I have to individualize it. So I would tell anybody who's talking to a doctor, would you be willing to partner with me? I just, I just read something. We talked about the study that showed that mental health is better on keto, right? So if I had a mental health professional in front of me, I would say to that mental, you know what? I just read this study that showed that keto can improve mental health. Would you be willing to partner with me as I... Uh, adopt this diet. And that partnership would look like, first of all, not demonizing me because I have a study that shows this stuff works. Number two, 
if my symptoms are improving, would you be willing to reduce my medicine and work in partnership with me? Um, but so I think the key is to give them information that they may not know because most clinicians are not focused on nutrition, uh, although they should be. And then you have to work with a clinician who will partner. Now, some people can't find a clinician who will partner. They just don't believe keto is a good thing, although the American Heart Association endorses low-carb and keto. And what's funny about their position statement that was done in March of 2022, it's very recent. They said in their position statement, if you're doing very low-carb, which is keto, you need to be careful. And what they meant by that is, it's so effective at improving your symptoms reduce, you're going to have to be weaned off your diabetes medicines and your blood pressure medicine. <laughs> so you need to be careful. And thankfully, the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners, they have uh, Adele Hyde, who's now deceased, wrote the uh, therapeutic guidelines for carb uh, reduction. And you can share that with your clinician and say, hey, there's a way to do this safely so that I won't have hypoglycemia or hypotension so, so, it, so the goal is to partner with your clinician, provide resources in a respectful manner. If for any reason you can't find a clinician like that, the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners and Low Carb USA and the diet doctor have search engines to find doctors who have metabolic training so that you can find somebody in your area that may align with that. But what we don't want to do is be with clinicians who are not willing to partner. The good news is when done the right way, I think that they will honor that. It's all about res being respectful of what they do, and but also saying that I need you to be my partner. And, and to the second part? Um, now let's go to that. Yes. So <laughs> I almost forgot about that. So <laughs> let's talk about uh, is the um, cholesterol an issue? Well, the, the, it really comes down to what we focus on, right? And one of the, the some of the eye-opening things that happen um, with knowledge is that, so when you learn biochemistry, I had to relearn it with my master's in nutrition, and you start understanding how the body works. The first thing that's important is, should we focus on the total cholesterol? That's the first question. And the answer is, we probably shouldn't because the total cholesterol has the good cholesterol in there, it has the bad cholesterol in there. So if your total cholesterol is high, it may be high because you have a lot of the good cholesterol. So clinicians in general should not focus on the total because if it's high and it's because the good cholesterol, the HDL is high, then we're happy. That's good news. The other part of the equation is that the part that other that's also focused on is this so-called LDL cholesterol. And the problem with that is that the LDL cholesterol is, it has small and large particles. When, on a low-carb or keto diet, you increase the large particles, which if you can use a visual, they bounce off your arteries. They don't really cause as much, they don't get into the crevices of your arteries, where the, where the small particles do. Thankfully, with a, a, a keto diet, you increase the large ones and decrease the, the small ones. And unfortunately, in a low-fat diet, it's the opposite. You could argue just that alone <laughs> should make you lean towards um, the keto diet, recognizing that the total LDL is not important. You break it. So ask your doctor for particle sizes. When it comes to predicting heart disease, which is what this cholesterol is all about, your cholesterol and your LDL, I actually made a video about uh, LDL cholesterol. So if people search my name in LDL cholesterol, they'll see it. In that video, you'll see a graph and the cholesterol and, L, uh, and the LDL, if that's the baseline, your blood pressure is 1.9 times more predictive of a future heart attack than the cholesterol and the LDL. That's number one. Number two, your fasting insulin level is 6.9 eight times more predictive of a future heart attack. So in other words, we have better things to measure to predict your risk for a heart attack. One of the, one of the other things is your triglycerides divided by your HDL 
So the fats divided by the good cholesterol ratio, it should be less than two. If it's greater than two, your risk for a heart attack is greater. Some patients get a, a lipoprotein, small particle A test. That test can uh, is very predictive of a future heart attack. There's an APOL lipoprotein B to A ratio test. That's more predictive. I think the best test to predict a future heart attack is your uh, coronary artery calcium score test. And in our health system, it's a $50 test. So, so from a cholesterol perspective, would I worry about doing keto? Um, I would think that keto would improve your uh, your risk for that. Now, when it comes to blood pressure, um, <clears throat> a lot of people think about salt. I just released a video a few months ago talking about how your blood pressure is more of a, a sugar problem than a salt problem. It is true that if you have carbohydrates attracting water and salt, it will put more volume in your body and that's going to raise your blood pressure. So salt's important. But what they forget in traditional medicine is that if I have, if I eat foods that are high in sugar, that's going to lead to hyperinsulinemia and hyperinsulinemia leads to sodium retention or salt retention in your kidneys. So even if you restrict salt, if you consume a lot of starchy foods that lead to high insulin, you're still going to end up with high blood pressure. So, it, so the root cause, as you know very well, Violet, is inflammation caused from the wrong diet leading to hyperinsulinemia. And not only are you getting more sodium retention, you're going to have this you know, endothelial cell dysfunction. And those cells around your, art, your vessels should be making nitric oxide. Nitric oxide expands things. So now you're not making that. The inflammation brings all these macrophages in. So you have all this damage that's occurring. And so if we can get to the root cause, this is the cool thing about keto. We actually get rid of salt in that dietary pattern. So now, not only are we not restricting salt, we may have to consume some salt just to balance things out. Mm. So now I can eat fat and salt. My food's going to taste pretty nice. <laughs> and, and I'm also able to improve my blood pressure by focusing on sugar instead of salt. So short answer, keto is good for your blood pressure. It's good for your cholesterol. And people who are doing that dietary pattern should not fear that particularly since the American Heart Association, American Diabetes Association, and the Association of Clinical Endocrinology all endorse a lower carb diet, which leads us to keto. So we don't have to... Now, a few years ago, we were outliers. They were like, what's wrong with Violet and Dr. Hampton? What are they saying? This is not good for your heart. But now the large organizations, they can't deny science and the science supports this dietary approach. So the cholesterol going up, you're saying, hmm, not really an issue or it might not be an issue, they need a, a more specific test yes. to see if it's an issue. So if they did the standard typical test, you're probably much less worried about that. But the blood pressure going up could be an issue, or maybe my interpretation is. It could be that because you're doing keto, but maybe maybe sometimes your numbers are too high, that, so you're not really in a ketogenic state. So you yeah. would still have weight loss, obviously, because you're doing better yeah. than standard American diet because the person says, I had success on keto. So you might, but maybe you just didn't, you're not in keto long enough or for you to yeah. get the full impact. I think so. Um, it is unusual, to be honest, to see a person doing keto and their blood pressure goes up. But, but again, it's, it's all about what you just said. The first part is, are you doing keto properly? Uh, there are levels to this. Technically, 50 or less is technically um, an opportunity to be in ketosis. But... The success rate at that level is only probably in the 60 to 70% range in terms of being in true keto. Everybody's different. If I have a, a person who's more athletic and doing other stuff, they're probably going to have an easier time than others. The success rate at 20 is near 100%. If you're following, like if you go to a Dr. Eric Westman at Duke who does research, it's nearly 100% success rate if you're less than 20. That's why a lot of clinicians tend to lean towards that number when they're doing therapeutic carb restriction, which is like prescription dose uh, keto, right? So I would 
the, to heal, so I mentioned the blood vessels and nitric oxide. In order for those endothelial cells to heal after years of eating a diet that causes inflammation, it sometimes takes time. So I would give it more time and I would make sure that number is low uh, in terms of total carbs. And it's very unlikely that that's going to um, uh, not real success. Having said that, I have a NEST acronym nutrition, exercise, less stress, more sleep, how we think, recovering from trauma as the nest. Maybe you need to also look at those other aspects of your life, which is why I think broader. So maybe I need to start adding the optimizing of my sleep to the equation. Because if I don't get enough sleep, as an example, when you look at research, you get, you get like four or five hours of sleep, your next day, your for 12 hours, your pressure is going to be higher. If you just in, did the next day. So if you're going to see your doctor, if you're going to see Dr. Hampton, <laughs> make sure you get enough sleep because your pressure is going to probably be higher. So, so you want to start looking at those other things. And when you're making dietary changes, there's stress. Your body's under stress because it's not accustomed to you going in a completely different direction. Our body likes to be you know, they, it likes homostasis. It likes things to be where they are. So when you start changing, that's a stressor to your body, even though it's a good stressor. But usually once the dust settles, everything settles down and you can do much better after that. This person also asked another question. It goes back to the whole idea of diabetes. She wanted to know um, the time range. If someone does keto well, mm -hmm. how long does it usually take before they don't need their diabetic medication? It's really interesting because it does depend on uh, how insulin resistant you are. In other words, how effective are you at, you know, making sure the glucose that you're consuming gets into your cell? Some people are more resistant than others. One way to determine that is to measure a fasting insulin level. So that same fasting insulin level that can predict a future heart attack also predicts future diabetes, which is a beautiful thing. You can predict diabetes five to 10 years in advance, literally by, and nobody's ordering this test. It's amazing. And then why is that true? Because your pancreas, which is under your left rib, the pancreas is going to rev up the production of insulin to maintain your blood sugar because uh, you only have a teaspoon of uh, sugar in your blood at any time. So anything above that, your body considers potentially toxic. So it's going to rev up the insulin so that you can put the sugar in the right place, not in your blood. So if my insulin level is super high, I'm probably insulin resistant. I also have a C-peptide test I can check. Now, all diabetics should check, check this test. It's also a way to determine inflammation. If my C-peptide is suggesting I'm not even making enough insulin, that could be an issue if it's too low. So the first thing is to understand who's in front of you. A person who's larger is probably more insulin resistant than a person who's thinner. Although we do have TOFI, thin on the outside, fat on the inside. So people who have visceral fat, fat around their organs, they could also be insulin resistant, even though they don't look like it. Particularly when you look at certain cultures like Asian cultures, they tend to be at higher risk for that. So some people particularly when you start thinking about Jason Fong and intermittent fasting, he gets people off of insulin in a, a month because you basically are saying, I'm not even eating anything. My pancreas can rest and all of that insulin production levels off and you can recover quite quickly. In my clinical experience, if I have a very dedicated person, particularly if they're under 20 carbs a day, they can get off of their metformin or whatever within easily between visits, between visits and three months, easily. In fact, I have to warn them. In fact, I, in our health system, we have a pharmacy team and I will refer them to the pharmacy team who can kind of walk with them so they can kind of de-prescribe. Imagine living in a world where we don't prescribe medicines, but we de-prescribe medicines. And that's what happens with this dietary pattern. The other thing that we must be thinking about is that because this is, potentially going to lead to low sugars. Uh, you have to have, I mentioned, you know, you have the guidelines for therapeutic carb restriction with the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners. So you can go to that site and click under resources and find the guidelines so that a person who has gout maybe eases down 
Because if you're excreting ketones because your body's not used to using it for fuel, you can't excrete the uric acid, which is related to gout. Therefore, you can have a gout flare or a kidney stone related to a uric acid flare. So the key is to understand what's happening with the body so that when you make these changes, you're not uh, disappointed with the potential side effects. For example, I mentioned uh, salt is going to be uh, excreted from your body with keto. But that also includes magnesium and potassium. So we need to know our electrolytes may be a little off in the beginning. So some people will take those as supplements. I may, uh, because of magnesium being lost, I may have a higher risk for constipation. So maybe I'm taking magnesium for that or, or cramps. And in some cases, your so-called bad cholesterol may go up. But, it, but keep in mind, the uh, just as a reminder, your, your, your large LDL particles go up, your small go down. So from a heart risk factor uh, pr perspective, we don't have to really worry about that. And lastly, when you're making these changes, which can occur quickly, you need to be aware that certain medicines should be uh, reduced like insulin, but medicines like uh, Jardius. Jardius is a medicine that makes you kind of urinate out your sugar. And it's called the SGLT2 inhibitor. And that increases your risk for something called metabolic acidosis. So people who are doing keto should be cautious of using that. Um, but as long as these things are understood, the benefits of achieving metabolic health with keto outweigh any of the concerns that people have. And yes, you can get off medicines very quickly. And um, I haven't really found a medicine that'll help you get off a medicine but I have found lifestyle that helps you get off medicine. So if you're, if that's part of your journey and you're not a type one diabetic who will then just have better control, this is the path. And if your doctor is not aware of that, there's nothing wrong with your doctor. They're just not trained on nutrition. I had two weeks of nutrition in medical school. I just interviewed a doctor for our health system who had zero hours of nutrition and she's just graduating this year. So if we're not teaching our doctors about nutrition, don't be surprised when they don't understand nutrition. That's good for us to hear a doctor say, <laughs> but it's sad for that we're still saying it at this right. stage of the game. I want to go back to something you said a few seconds ago about gout, because I, I'm not sure I understood it well. Yes. So if I do a, a keto diet and I do it well, that can impact my gout? Yes. In uh, a negative in a good, way? Yeah, negative but... Way? But it's good. It's good, ultimately. Okay. So let's think. Of it. <laughs> okay. So again, going back to what I stated. So when you're initially being introduced to this, when you're changing your fuel source from uh, glucose to ketones, which are really the only two main fuel sources we think about. We, we, alcohol is a fuel source, but we're not thinking about that. What happens is your body is not fat adaptive or keto, keto adaptive, meaning it doesn't know how to use uh, ketones, which is fat as fuel yet. It's just like, now we know if we take our, our car, which has electric and gas, right? If we're fortunate to have one of those, we know that if we just flip the switch, it'll work, but our bodies are not like cars. You flip from a body that's been used to burning glucose as its primary fuel to ketones. It's not going to know what to do with the ketones yet. It may take a couple of weeks. What's, so what's going to happen is you're going to be peeing out all those ketones in your urine. Right. Unfortunately, that's going to compete with uric acid, which is when that builds up, it causes things like gout and uric acid kidney stones. So, so the goal is when I'm transitioning and I, and I have a history of gout or kidney stones from uric acid, what you, what you want to do is... First of all, if you're make sure your doctor's aware. And again, if they read those guidelines for therapeutic heart restriction, they would see that listed as something we should be cautious about. Some doctors will just say, well, let's, you're not really taking the uh, gout medicine regularly because you're not having flares. So let's just put you on it for a few weeks so that it'll help. Maybe your body won't make as much. Allopurinol will reduce the production of uric acid. So I don't make as much. Some people would say maybe going down to 20 right away is not a good idea. They'll say, let's, you're at 300 carbs. Let's go to 100. 
Let's do that for a little bit. And then we'll go to 50 and we'll ease into it. And that'll give your body time to adapt. So to go, so you don't ever want to look at these discussions and say, I shouldn't do keto because it's going to flare up my gout. What you do is you say, uh, I need to understand what's happening so I can ease into it. So the things I tell people who are in this category, besides, you know, adjusting their medicines or easing them into it, I say, you're not the kind of person that should be going in and out of ketosis. Because every time you do that, you're going to have a risk of a gout flare again. You're going to have, you know, so why do that? You should probably stay in that state a little bit longer. But I have some good news because you kind of suggested, why am I going to do all that if it's not making it better? It's making it worse. It actually does make it better. And what they found in research is when you become metabolically healthy, uh, you're kind of in this ketosis state or just in a low carb state, what happens is the inflammation and all the things that would flare up your gout in the first place go away. So in my clinical experience and what I've seen in some of the research, people who eat this way don't have gout flares anymore. So it's a, so I have people who have gout flares a couple of times a year. Hey, doc, I can't remember the last time I had a gout flare. But those are the people who are following this dietary pattern, are consistent with it, not going in and out. And they find that they're, they kind of get their life back because as you could imagine, some people with gout is a disaster. And if you keep having those flares, uh, what's going to happen is that inflammation is going to start to cause degradation of the bone in that joint where it's occurring. Now you have arthritis, which is more chronic as opposed to acute attacks. So, so your diet can really reduce your risk of having gout flares and put you in, you know, improve your quality of life more than anything. Okay, perfect. So you just actually walked us into the next topic, I guess, which would be how effective is keto for arthritis? And well, this person had three topics, but you already talked about blood pressure. Okay. Arthritis and sleep apnea. Okay. And I'm not um, sure if they're related, <laughs> but they seem to have all three of these ideas right now. I don't, yeah, it's, I think they are. I think like one of the, why do I call myself the metabolic health doc? Because so many of the conditions we suffer from are metabolic conditions. My wife's dad has dementia. They call it dementia type three diabetes. Right. Cancer cells love sugar as its primary fuel. It's called the Warburg effect. I think the guy won a Nobel Prize. Hypertension, inflammation, we just talked about that. Metabolic. So the, the chances are, ding, 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 if you give me any topic, it's good chances related. So let's talk about sleep apnea. And so many people suffer from that. Now, I've seen amazing results in my clinical practice with sleep apnea. It seems like consistently people who do keto will lose weight because of the, you know, they're using fat as their fuel and some of that fat's on their body. They burn the fat, they lose weight. But it also, because of the weight loss improves sleep apnea, the question is why? And it's kind of obvious because if people lose weight, some of the areas where we see weight loss is in their neck, right? And when you reduce the soft tissue around the neck, when you think about snoring, right? A lot of times you're snoring because your airway is kind of just too congested. So now you're losing that soft tissue. Your tongue, believe it or not, will shrink as you do this dietary pattern. Your belly has to get out of the way when you're trying to breathe and expand. And, 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 and so if you have more room to sleep well, expand your, your, your lungs, you'll sleep better. So people with sleep apnea who lose weight actually have a path to not even being on a CPAP machine anymore. In fact, that's the only, in my career, I've been doing this, believe it or not, for 30 years this year. I've been a doctor for 30 years. I have never seen a patient personally get off a CPAP unless they've had substantial weight loss. I've seen a ton of patients get off CPAP with that weight loss. So when I talk to patients, you never want to be a doctor that's like, if you just lose weight, you know, the, 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 you know, the C will part and everything will be okay. That's not completely true. There are, if you have really bad arthritis that's been damaged 
for years and years, there may be some damage that we can't reverse, right? We know the inflammation will be better, et cetera. But, but I'm telling you something, if you lose weight, you can actually do a tremendous job for sleep apnea. So yes, is keto going to impact sleep apnea? Yes. Number two is arthritis, right? And this is a little easier because arthritis is, um, is all about inflammation, right? And there's different types of arthritis. We have rheumatoid, which is really an autoimmune condition. We have osteo, which is kind of overuse. Lupus is, can cause arthritis. And we talked about gout, uric acid crystals in your joints can cause arthritis, right? So keto is a beautiful fuel source because unlike uh, glucose, when I, I spoke at the uh, symposium for metabolic health, once called Low Carb USA, and I talked about the mitochondria. But when you so when, when you take the mitochondria, which is the energy source for your body, and you give it different types of fuel, the fuel that creates the most waste and byproducts is glucose. So that's like a factory. And you see the smoke coming from the factory. Your body has to get rid of all that smoke. Number two, if I take ketones and use it as fuel, it's like a solar panel. No smoke, it's very effective fuel, and it doesn't give you all those byproducts. So, so if you have a keto diet, you're going to reduce inflammation. And there's something that we've, some of you guys may have heard of reactive oxygen species where you have electrons that are looking for partners and they're, and if they don't find a partner, they react. We hear about that with COVID. When you eat a keto, a ketone based diet, you have less of that, which is even less uh, inflammation. So for many reasons, people who uh, have arthritis, which is your personal experience, I think, uh, Violet, they have less inflammation and it is a, a great way to use diet as a way to reduce your symptoms. Um, so I think, so I encourage people if you haven't done the experiment, this may be a good way to help with those symptoms. And we all have bodies we've been using for years. And as we get older, we have to give it a break. And if, and if we, we have to walk and live and function, but we don't have to give that extra inflammation uh, in our joints. And if we avoid that, we can at least stabilize things and in many cases improve things. There seems to be this idea that if I do keto, so this person particularly is saying since starting keto and fasting, mm -hmm. they're having insomnia mm. and they're asking if that's a phase. I, and I've heard like people talk about like having certain things seem to happen and they're not sure. Yeah. I, I have a, I, my idea was that, you know, is it about stress? But I'm wondering from your side, like, is there a, a medical reason why somebody might have insomnia? Yeah. It's keto is very interesting in that it, it actually, can help you when it comes to insomnia and it can it can help you. So and we need sleep because sleep is like easily one of the most important things we do. I sometimes drink coffee. Coffee's not a bad thing necessarily. Although it can be a bad thing for a guy with an irritable bowel history. But I thought I needed coffee until I realized how about if you just do the sleep part first? So if I get enough sleep, then I don't need coffee. So do I still drink coffee sometimes? Sure. Sometimes you can't get the sleep you need. But if I do get the sleep I need, I tend to avoid coffee. I just want to say that first. But sleep is very important because if I if I go a few things without days without sleep, I may not do very well. I can fast for a long time and... um I can avoid exercise for a little bit and be okay. If I go without sleep, it's over. So, so what happens with this type of dietary pattern is that everything's shifting. Your whole metabolic world is shifting in your body. And when that body is shifting from using fuel that was glucose, that dirty fuel we talked about, to fat fuel, that's a huge shift. And the first thing that's going to happen is that I'm going to feel, I'm going to have problems sleeping because my body's not used to that. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing you want to think about 
is um, keto flu. And I think most people are familiar with that. But what we don't think about is if I'm going through this process adapting to this diet and my body's struggling with it, we're going to be tired in terms of feeling tired. But being tired and going to sleep is two different things. We're going to have headache issues. If I have a headache, I'm probably going to struggle. We're going to, so, and they even have something called keto insomnia. So when all of these metabolic changes are occurring, rather it's the metabolic changes or the keto flu, it's going to affect my sleep. So it just makes sense that I may struggle. Even carb withdrawal, um, we know sugar is like a drug and we know that it's going to affect our neurochemistry a little bit, right? So if we're going through a withdrawal, what's the chances you're going to be able to sleep well? It's like, it's going to be hard to sleep if I'm having my brain used to a certain feel, I'm changing it, that's going to affect my sleep. And then the electrolytes are going to be off. We've already talked about how in the past, you know, when you're doing keto, you're going to lose sodium, potassium, magnesium. That's why some people, you know, may need to replace those things unless you, that's why you have to make sure you have sufficient salt in your diet. So if my electrolytes are off, that may affect my brain. Why? Because electrolytes are electrical and they deal with my brain and uh, the, uh, our brain is just an electrical uh, circuitry, just like our heart. So if our electrolytes are off, then maybe the brain that's going to regulate my sleep is going to be off, right? So those are things that are absolutely going to occur. And uh, and because my electrolytes are important um, and may be impacted, and if it so if I'm on a so if if a, if a keto diet leads to me having to get rid of my body's going to get rid of salt, magnesium, potassium, those electrolytes, that may occur at night, right? So now when I normally would sleep through the night, when I'm becoming keto, I'm not quite fat adaptive, keto adaptive. I haven't gotten used to it yet. I may be waking up to pee, <laughs> for lack of better words, at night. So those are the things that I think about that can cause problems with sleep, but I got good news. <laughs> once you become keto adaptive, once you become keto adaptive, that's when the magic happens. Now, my blood sugars are not up and down. They're stable. And a more stable blood sugar, I'm not on the roller coaster anymore, equals better sleep. That's first. Um, and when I've, I've seen research that shows that your, your deep sleep, and as m many of us know, the deep sleep, rapid eye movement sleep is the sleep that's a better quality sleep. And what they find is that people who uh, do a keto diet, they tend to have better deep sleep. And, and lastly, um, there are some neurotransmitters we need to be aware of, like GABA. And GABA is a neurotransmitter which uh, kind of relaxes the mind, makes you feel more relaxed. And uh, people who have a keto diet tend to get a little bit of a boost of that uh, that that neurotransmitter. So I think for so so if you can get past the initial struggles, uh, which happens to anybody who's going from one dietary pattern to the next, if a, if a, if you're if you're an alcoholic and you stop drinking alcohol, you're going to go through a withdrawal. If you stop the sugar drug, you're going to go through a withdrawal. If you can get past that, you can stand up before your friends. Yes, just like the alcoholic or person who drinks alcohol. I hate alcoholic term. Yes, I was sugar addicted, but now I've overcome it. Thank you for supporting me through my withdrawal. And all of a sudden, those things that you desire in the past won't be as important to you. So there's a possibility that um, the the actual process of detoxing is what's interrupting the sleep. That's what I understand from that. That's exactly correct. Okay. You mentioned your IBD before. And mm. what I want to know is, there's a, someone was asking, is there are there any foods that are keto okay, but that we shouldn't be eating anyways if we have IBD. Yeah, um man, this is, you know, it's funny. Um 
because there, you know, there are some things that really bothered me or still bother me. For example, I recently um, wanted to try, it was uh, a, one of those keto products, right? And actually it was a supplement. It was one of those like little drinks with, you know, energy, but it didn't, ha it had a little caffeine in it. But then when I looked at it, it had uh, artificial sweetener in it, like sucralose. And it just didn't work for me. So it just, mm -hmm. it just tore my stomach up. And a lot of these artificial sweeteners tend to disrupt your microbiome. Your microbiome is going to be different with carnivore and keto than it is as a plant-based person. So it doesn't have to be the same. Doesn't even have to be as diverse as we've been told. But so those types of foods, I tend, so sugar alcohols for me are a no-no. So when, if I do any products that are keto friendly and I'm trying to do a sugar, I personally have to lean towards a stevia or pure monk fruit because regular monk fruit may have sugar alcohol in it. That'll work better for me. Um, I think in general, you have to decide which plants don't work for you. For me, it's uh, things like uh, Brussels sprouts, cabbage. Uh, they just bother me. And I think you have to kind of listen to your body because your body will tell you which foods work better for that particular person. So I really, I try really hard to uh, avoid those things. Processed food in general, because there's so many things they add to it, are to be avoided. So we tend to eat at home often because we don't know what they're putting in the food uh, when, you, when you're when you in a restaurant. So I literally, if I make a, a ribeye with just salt, uh, which I thought would be boring, right? But if you put sufficient salt on it, you do just fine. The herbs tend to be okay. For one of my favorite seasoning is charcoal seasoning, believe it or not, uh, which they do. You can you know buy on Amazon. Um, I I try to keep things simple because when I start making things complex, it tends to cause problems with my gut. But the thing that I think is important to understand is why is it that a guy who um, had a stomach problem is able to do better initially with probiotics because probiotics are um, gonna, people don't always understand why probiotics, why fiber. And the there's something called um, uh, small chain fatty acids. So when you feed fiber to your gut, you tend to, uh, you know, feed the, the, the back, you know, the microbiome, but then they make small chain fatty acids, which then can feed your cells of your intestine. If so, so you, you would say, well, if you're having irritable bowel doc, you have to eat a lot of fiber so you can feed the bacteria so they can make these small chain fatty acids. Right. And that'll help your gut to be healthy, which is true, but it's also true ding, 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 that the keto diet also gives you small chain fatty acids in the form of beta hydroxybutyrate. Because I was trying to figure out why is it that I don't have problems on this diet? And then I realized, oh, because I'm giving my body all the beta hydroxybutyrate it'll need to feed my intestinal lining. So that's why my gut is happy when I eat this dietary pattern because I'm giving it exactly what it needs to be healthy. So for me, if you ask me why I do keto and more carnivore than anything, is because my gut rewards me uh, when I eat that way. And now I can go to the symposium for metabolic health and get in front of all these people and speak without worrying about having to go to the bathroom. Because you get nervous when you get in front of people, right? And now I've learned that if I eat the right foods, I'll give my body what it needs. And that's why it's so important that we understand a little biochemistry so we'll understand why. But more importantly, why is it that some people eat a plant-based diet and do okay and other people eat carnivore and do okay? And I think we're all different. 
Now, I would argue that the diet where we restrict, you know, well, that's for lack of better words, where we reduce carbs is better for most of us. But what happens metabolically changes when you change your diet. So for example, if I were to give a different example, unrelated, why is it that I don't become vitamin C deficient on this dietary pattern? I should be because you get that from fruit and things like that, right? Well, something magical happens when you're on a diet where you're eating more animal-based. Your body says, huh, this person's not giving me the fruit, so I'm going to become more efficient at harvesting the vitamin C from other sources. Well, if you're carnivore, you're only eating animals. Oh, by the way, beef does have vitamin C in it. Oh, by the way, if you eat liver, it's about 10 times as much as they have in beef. So by eating this way, metabolically, I will harvest more of the vitamin C I need so I won't get scurvy. But more importantly, if I eat this way, I will, I will find myself in a place where my body has figured out you know what, I'm going to harvest more energy, I'm going to harvest more vitamin C from the right, you know, from this, this, these, uh, this liver. And, and I just think that this is important because what we'll do is we'll compare research from the standard American diet compared to vegan, the standard American diet compared to Mediterranean. And then instead of comparing it to carnivore, we'll then extrapolate, well, if this fiber is important for that, dietary pattern compared to the standard American, it must be important for the carnivore diet. And that's just not true. It, so we have to start. So we need more research so we can not just have anecdotal examples like I just gave, but so that we can, we'll be able to then say, we've done the study and we now see, oh, we saw that Sean Baker's group, <laughs> they didn't have scurvy in that large carnivore group, but now we have the science to support it but I have not been vitamin C deficient when I'm doing carnivore. And I think that people need to understand that we need to, we need to understand that things change when you eat differently, including the microbiome. The microbiome of, of a carnivore is different than the microbiome of a vegan, but that doesn't mean that either diet is bad for you necessarily. We just have to understand a vegan needs to supplement a certain way and a carnivore needs to be aware of things like electrolytes. But that doesn't mean that either diet is going to be a problem. I just think for most people in this in in America and in Canada and elsewhere, um, they need to eat what's essential, which is protein and fat. I feel like we often are trying to eat for survival rather than eating for optimal health. We get told things like we need fiber for X, Y, Z. And mm -hmm. it's more of a survival mentality of, well, you're not going to the bathroom, so eat this fiber to make you go to the bathroom, rather right. than going back to this idea of, but what's the real reason that you weren't going to the bathroom in the first place? And I feel like sometimes, and I learned this from Dr. Barry, I believe, mm -hmm. where he was saying how people were freaking out on carnivore because they weren't going to the bathroom as often. But in fact, on carnivore, you don't need to go to the bathroom as often. You don't. You're not yeah. pushing unnecessary fiber through the system all the time. You don't need and, it. And, yeah. If, and if we don't need it, so we we set ourselves up is what I, I guess I'm and understanding need, here. And you just need to know <laughs> that, oh, maybe if I am having issues with constipation, well, why? And the key is how much fluid are you drinking? Do you have enough magnesium in your diet? In other words, once you understand why, then you can say, oh, it's not that the diet's bad. It's because I didn't understand that my electrolytes are changing. And I think that's the key. I, I made a whole video about fiber and the, the one randomized control study that was quoted in the video. Of the, there were six people who were doing high fiber. They all pretty much had symptoms, bloating, uh, constipation. On a high fiber diet, of the like 60 or so people, I'm not sure why it was a big difference in numbers. They had like this huge number of people who were doing no fiber. How many people had constipation, bloating, pain in that group? I'm going to guess zero. <laughs> zero. <laughs> so we can't argue with science. And so, and that's why we need more research so that people 
when they're facing a, a world where they're saying fiber is what you is essential. It's not first of all, it's a carb, so it's not essential. Right. And and what you just said about putting that you that if you eat something like a steak, it just you use pretty much the whole thing. So you're not going to create a lot of waste from that. Therefore, you're not going to have the key is, is my bowel movement normal when I have it, even if it's twice a week? Is it hard? Am I straining? If you're not doing those things and it comes out normal, then you don't have constipation. So I think part of it's defining what that looks like. And then the other part is to mitigating, you know, we have to know what the expectations should be. Yeah, I, I definitely think that that's part of it is definitions. Yes. We've lived so long being told that this is what it is. And every time you eat, you should go to the bathroom. And that, and so people are expecting to go three, four times a day. And, and it's just like, it's that's not reality for a lot of people. Right. That's right. You said earlier, the body's job is to get sugar out of the blood and put it where it belongs, right? Put it somewhere else that's not going to harm us. And the thing that I want to point out too is we only focus on one place we think it belongs. We think the body takes sugar and puts it in fat storage. And that's the only thing... It, but yet our body is telling us that that's not true because we have inflammation in places. We have, we, we have damage all over our body from the sugar that needs to be put somewhere because in the blood it will kill us. And I feel like one thing that I, I hope is going to come out of this conversation is when people are living the negative, that they're more open to looking at where might this negative be coming from. The next question that I have here, and that's kind of where this came from, is glaucoma, which is someplace mm -hmm. that you don't often, you don't, first thought isn't glaucoma related to sugar, but my guess is that very <laughs> likely it's related. It's, it's related to everything. Uh, one of the most fascinating moments I had in my training was to work with an ophthalmologist. His name was Dr. Springer. Still see him. Although I have LASIK now, so I mean, I don't know what that means, but I still see him. and. Um, and we looked in the eyes with this highly magnified, and you can see the blood vessels, right? And it was amazing. It, lo it looks like I was looking at red blood cells floating through the arteries. That's how amazing it was. Well, they have done studies on this. And, and by the way, they do have diabetes with cataract, diabetes with glaucoma, because they actually, they're related. I mean, the fact that we actually have that diagnosis in our chart is telling you a lot. So, so, the, so they did a study on some mice. So they don't, I don't, I have not seen a study on uh, humans, but they did a study on mice. Um, and uh, it may have been in the Journal of Neuroscience. Uh, but in that study, they did find that when you do a keto diet on the mice, and what they did is mice, usually about the 10th month is when they started to become like senior like. So they, they, I think they gave the, um, keto diet at like the eighth or ninth, right before that would happen. And what they found is that in those mice, yes, they were able to show improvement in the, in the neural cells or the optic nerve or the eyes of the mice and uh, reduce, like it had kind of an antioxidant effect for keto. So, so I was actually um, going to reach out to a doctor who uh, I saw on the diet doctor website uh, because she's an ophthalmologist, Dr. Anna Lorenzo. Um, and I'm going to ask her to be on the podcast because she's a doctor who recommends keto for eye health. So now have I seen this in my practice? Yes. I've seen people come to me and they, they're really doing well with keto and they'll say, the doctor's saying things are getting better. I'm like, how does it get better? The pressure's going down in their eyes. Uh, the cataract's not progressing. Uh, the retinal damage that comes from diabetes retinopathy is improving because you're reducing the... So, so we don't have enough studies to kind of say a, a slam dunk, but what I see in my clinical practice is that it's a real thing that's happening. So it's really... And I think you don't really have much to lose. You're doing something that's going to really help you reduce inflammation. And the, at the worst case, it'll probably stabilize things. So it's really worth trying for anybody that's concerned about their vision. I wasn't sure because I, I'm not really sure if glaucoma is something that can be reversed, but it can not. be improved and stabilized from my experience. So again, uh, I've seen it like 
where people's pressures are high. They do it for three to six months and they, it gets better. So I think okay. it's inflammation. So I, I, but, but again, we need studies on humans, not mice. <laughs> Is there any um, negative effect of cycling in and out of keto? So, and the, I guess the question is really coming because there's like always this concern that keto long-term is dangerous. Like we hear that right. all the time, like you're going to, some, somehow you're going to ruin your health. So is there a negative impact of doing keto long-term? Should we be cycling in and out? I don't think so. Um, I, I guess we should ask Dr. Eric Westman. He's been doing research on this since 2002. He took uh, on the uh, Atkins, Dr. Atkins mantle. So Dr. Uh, Eric Westman, I think he partnered with a nurse who worked with Dr. Atkins. They were going to do some research together and then Dr. Atkins passed away. Uh, so, so based on 2002, the research he's done, no. If you want to go back to the hunters and gatherers concept, no. Uh, there's always people who, I think the key, let me say it differently. The key is, you know, what's happening that I need to worry about. Um, uh, so when we think about any dietary pattern, there's a potential for nutrient deficiencies, right? When we think about vegans, we worry about, you know, B12, we think we worry about omega, uh, omega three. Um, and, and we know we need those types of things to be healthy. And we know that the plant sources of omega three are not as sufficient as the, the DHA and EPA, which is part of that omega-3, uh, that you'll get from uh, animals. So the key is there, you're going to always uh, have the potential with any dietary pattern. Uh, you can be vegan and eat all the spinach you want, but you're going to only absorb 3% because non-heme iron, which is from plants versus heme from meat, is absorbed differently. So I worry about uh, I don't worry about iron when, it, when I'm on an animal-based diet, but I definitely worry about it when I'm on a plant-based diet. So I think that's important to understand. And so I guess because of the research of Dr. Eric Westman and what he's been able to do, I'm not worried about that. And for people who are animal-based or close to carnivore, let's just make sure my sodium, potassium, magnesium are okay. If those things are okay and all your metabolic markers are improving, when I do my insulin level, is it okay? Fasting insulin. When I do my A1C, is that in a normal range? When I do my triglycerides to HDL ratio, is my coronary artery calcium score okay? Is my LDL particles okay? Is my So what you do is you look at the things that matter. My waist is okay. My blood pressure is okay. And if those things are okay, I think you're okay. So I think it's safe to say based on the research of others, anecdotal experience, uh, that if I get a person lose weight, they're not on medicine, their blood pressure is normal, they're not diabetic anymore, I'm not sure how that's ever a bad thing. And keto will help you achieve all those goals. We'll continue to do research, but again, uh, we're looking at 20 plus years of research and people have been in that state and probably examples that go beyond that and they're doing just fine. So to worry about that, I think is not really based on the science that we see in front of us. It also seems to me that like the, the ones for keto that you said we should be looking at, sodium, potassium, magnesium, but magnesium and potassium are two that even on a standard diet, people are oh. are asked are, are not getting enough of. So I, I don't believe that the diet is the is the issue there. I think it's just knowing where to get magnesium and potassium is the bigger That's issue. That's right. Yeah. Whole foods diet, no matter how you approach it, is the key and uh, and listening to your body. And most of my patients are not like focused on measuring those things as much as just trying to follow the dietary pattern and eat real food as much as possible. And I also just want to add here that I think that part of the reason this question comes up, and it comes up often, it comes up so often, <laughs> is because it's more about the fact that keto seems different than yeah. what we were doing, right? Like right. we're so used to doing a diet that has so much more carb in it. Right. And then you right. have all these sources that say carbs are essential. They're not. And so we end up in that story where we are being told that, oh, you better be careful. You're going to harm your health. And, and, and it's scary. Right. 
Because the truth is, most of us are doing what we're doing because we want to feel better, not worse. That's right. And we're just trying to feed the population. A lot of the uh, influx of a lot of the carby heavy foods was to feed people at a time where people were struggling with getting food uh, and starvation was an issue. And so we had to, you know, change the landscape of many places to, to, to grow the corns and the wheats and all of these things. Uh, and, and what you find is that it was done because of, it was a different time. Now we have more access to foods that are essential, uh, like the protein and fat. And, and, and so if we're not in an area where that's still true, I know in, in the United States it's not true, and I'm sure in Canada it's not true, then we should be able to now go back to the foods that give us the most bang for the buck. And, but again, any logical person would say, yes, I want to eat my essential fat and protein before I eat non-essential foods. And if it's not essential, that means that your body can take fat and protein and turn it into glucose on your behalf at a, at a clip that's based on your body's needs instead of the overconsumption that we tend to do. So if we put ourselves in that frame of mind, what will happen is our body will then do the magic that it can do, and it'll actually take care. It'll take over from there. But we're we're kind of forcing down all of this extra uh, food that's high in carbs, and your body's spending too much energy. Too much energy is being expended to remove what should have never been put in the body in the first place. So I'm really optimistic that as we continue to learn more about nutrition, more clinicians, more uh, people who are teaching wellness will be able to spread this message so that the people can then rise up and say, you know what, this is what's best for me. This is what feels best for me. And that's what I'm going to do. And that, and then less reliance. We need pharmaceuticals to make vaccines and to make uh, a medicine, but we don't want to rely on that as the answer when we already have an answer, which is wellness through nutrition. And I think that wellness through nutrition when it was a starting point for us years ago, when you go back in history, like that's all we had. Yeah. And the more advanced we become, the more we try to say we can do it better than nature. And I think that's a huge mistake. We we can't do it better than nature. <laughs> but we want to, and we try to, and and, we, and that's what I think gets us into trouble. Is like some of these, some of the push towards medication, even for diabetes, the push yes. towards medic medication rather than having that real world conversation with your with the client that says this is actually what you need to do this is your prescription right. do it that's right and it's cheaper i mean if we spend $900 for a medicine like ozempic which is better um for weight loss and diabetes because it doesn't cause insulin spiking and it does show slow gastric emptying and it tells your liver not to make as much glucose etc and you know it kind of helps with your appetite but you know, it's $900 a month. It has side effects. And how about instead of trying to mitigate uh, and, and, and deal with the poison once we've consumed it, how about if we just teach the population not to consume what's causing the problem? That's a cheaper, more effective approach than to you know, try to get this drug that you can't even get anymore, at least in the United States, because everybody's trying to use the uh, antidote uh, as opposed to avoid the poison. The next question that I have for you is um, about artificial sweeteners. Oh, Lord. Since we're on the sugar topic, yes. um, do artificial sweeteners spike insulin? Because if they don't, don't, do most doctors recommend that we stay away from them? Is it simply because of the sweetness that will trigger us to want more sweets? And the reason that the person's asking is because they have cravings, they like to drink diet soda and diet sparkling juice because they feel like it helps them to have a little happiness in their life. Um, and the question is, but is it dangerous? Yeah. Um, there's levels to this. So if, if I were to go back to the people who do research, uh, like Dr. Eric Westman, he will allow people to use artificial sweeteners as they transition. Uh, some people struggle. So a diet soda, a zero soda, would be allowed. So, so no matter what artificial sweetener you're using, sweet and low, uh, you know, Splenda, whatever, um, for the most part, for the most part, 
they will not cause your blood sugar to spike, which is why Dr. Eric Westner say, says it's okay. But there are uh, some that will still potentially do it, particularly the sugar alcohols. So when you think about xylitol and sorbitol, those types of sweeteners, they can potentially uh, cause some blood spikes, right? So this is how I frame it with my patients. Uh, in the short term, right, I think that the spiking that could occur with, so there's, you can just avoid the ones that can do that. I think about the, I tend to recommend stevia and, uh, man, you know, and uh, monk fruit, although they're made from natural sources. I think they're all artificial because by the time they finish processing it, but I tend to lean towards those. I mean, that's just my opinion. I mean, if you look at the processing of stevia, it's, it's you know, I don't know what you end up with, but it's still considered a better option. So in the short term, if you're transitioning and you're trying to find a way to transition without the impact being too great, that's that's okay. I do have good news in that once you've kind of become fat adaptive, keto adaptive, where you're kind of using uh, fat as your fuel, uh, and you've moved away from the things that uh, are sweet, your taste buds change. So when I eat a blueberry, a blueberry tastes like a grape. Um, if I eat a piece of dark chocolate, which for most people is very bitter, it'll start tasting like chocolate. It, you'll still notice it's a little bitter, but it'll feel like you've satisfied that sweet tooth. So as you make this adjustment, you won't even need to have those artificial sweeteners in your life. And the last thing I'll say is, do we know everything there is to know about artificial sweeteners? No. So as you move towards wellness and as a wellness warrior, right? Your goal is to eat real whole foods to the extent you can. And when you do that, you don't have to worry about the potential that even though that artificial sweetener may not raise your sugar so much versus, you know, maybe the sugar alcohol is a little bit, then you don't have to worry about, am I going to get cancer from this? Because you have a lot of mixed messages about whether that's true or not. And I would argue if you eat whole foods, you can eliminate that concern. So that's kind of how I approach it with my patients. Okay to transition with it, but ultimately let's eat real whole foods and minimize the artificial sweeteners. I would, I, I, I was going to say that I had heard that, that um, like artificial sweeteners actually cause damage to the body. So that was something I, I was afraid of, but I yep. didn't know that there were some sugar alcohols that still cause insulin spikes. So that's interesting to learn. Yeah. Um, from the perspective that I'm going to throw in, into the ring here, that psychological part of the puzzle is still happening. When, when you eat something that tastes sweet, your brain does react as if you ate sweet. So your, your brain's having a reaction. But I think the other thing that's important for us to keep in mind is that there's a lot of processes that happen before even real sugar would have gotten into your, so because I taste sweet, my body starts doing things like putting sugar away to make space for the new sugar, right? So right, all right. of that's also going to have a huge impact on, even if you didn't have this, the, the insulin spike, you're still having a repercussion of sweet taste coming in. That's so right. I think it's a, it's a, it's slippery, that one. Right. It is. Right? <laughs> but, but not for the, yeah, not for the reason of an insulin spike. It's slippery for other reasons. Right. That's right. I believe that. Yeah. I believe that. Um, the same person asked about fitness. She's having trouble finding a running coach mm. because most running coaches don't believe in keto. And so the question it, that's coming is, can keto and endurance sports work together? Can, can I be a keto person doing endurance sports? Is that, is that healthy to do? Because apparently to her coaches, no. Yeah. When I was uh, at the Symposium for Metabolic Health uh, in 2022, uh, one of the people I had a chance to meet in person was Dr. Mark Cucuzzello. Um, and, you know, he's one of the uh, diet doctor, low-carb panel experts, uh, him along with a few of, of the other of us. And he he actually, his whole life is about 
keto and endurance sports because he was a, he's a runner, right? And but there have been studies. There have been studies that show that a keto diet uh, can uh, be done as an endurance runner um, and or any other sport. Although you need to be uh, keto adaptive uh, if you're going to be the most efficient at it. So if you're if you're like a most people who will watch this episode or uh, hear our voices are not you know, endurance athletes, right? So if you're saying for me, Dr. Hampton, who wants to jog every once in a while, is it okay for me to um, be on keto and do those things? Yeah, because, and you're also going to be using fat fuel, which may even give you more stamina uh, to do these exercises. Is it okay to add some carbs if you're highly athletic and you're doing that type of work? Absolutely. Uh, you have to be careful that you're, you know, not overdoing it, but yeah, absolutely. So I think be in ketosis before you start doing sports. Uh, make sure you understand your electrolytes. Maybe prepare your own snacks because the snacks that they're going to give you uh, when you're running are not going to be the ones or the ones we traditionally use. So I would say have the right kind of snacks like cheese sticks, peanut butter, whatever. And then, but but understand that you will initially probably have some consequences of that in the beginning, but then uh, down the road, uh, your body will become fat adaptive and it'll probably be just as good. So, so I don't think that the diminishing of your athletic performance being a keto athlete are enough to suggest that you shouldn't do it. Dr. Uh, Professor Tim Noakes and others who have gone down this rabbit hole already, they were getting sick while they were doing this high carb diet and they decided that being healthy was more important than any benefit that this uh, high carb lifestyle was going to create. So they had to do a complete 360. I mean, Professor Tim Noakes wrote books about, you know, high carb for running. And he had to do a 360 and own the fact that that was not the best advice for people who were following him. Okay, so then the, the end result is he was able to do running with low with, with keto and okay. he was able to do it without like uh uh any real horrible negative consequences so and it worked the, out for him one of the things that i remember and i don't remember which doctor i heard say this oh maybe it was dr fung actually mm -hmm. it was talking about the fact that the exercise that we do is relying on the energy that we ate yesterday anyways so this whole idea of the fact that, or this whole idea that we're eating today for this exercise is actually wrong. Our body's going to process, our body's going to put away, and it's going to be using glycogen stores or fat stores anyway. So it was a very interesting, you know, conversation from his point of view that the little bit that you're going to get from the food you eat in the moment, he was suggesting that that's only the part that's getting the toxin out, but then the rest of it's going to get stored. Yeah. Our families, we love them. We want them to do well. <laughs> um, but then, like, they, especially our parents, like, it's really hard for parents to hear their kids say, this is better, and maybe even try to change things that they've been doing forever. And so this one person is wanting to help her parents, make, it seems like, or elderly people mm -hmm. in her family, but they are not hearing it. She's wondering if there's anything we could do to help them to maybe try keto yeah um it kind of goes back to our conversation we had around glaucoma right so if we go back to that mice study and we are giving the mice the keto diet right before they enter those senior years in mice years right and they get better right so i think you have to understand what their why is so yeah. So the question is, if I can recommend a diet that will help you to reduce your risk for having cataract or glaucoma, would you be interested in that? If I could recommend a diet that will make you feel less tired and fatigued or that arthritis that's bothering you, would you be interested in that? So part of it is, is to understand what their why is. So I, you know, So what is it that what medical problem, this is what I do in clinic, it's a little 
tip. I know that metabolic health solves a lot of problems. So the first thing I do in clinic is I say, what has harmed your family? And they'll, and they'll name the medical conditions, diabetes, dementia, whatever. And then I'll say, well, what, ha what have you lived with? And so I'll say, of those things, rather it's something that harms your family or harms you, which one of those things do you want to really prevent happening to you or get better? They'll say it. And so if they say, like you, Violet, arthritis, so would you be interested in a diet that can reduce your arthritis symptoms without you having to take more medicine? And so I, I kind of move in that direction. Um, and I give them grace because I understand that any change when you're 70, 80 or beyond is, eh, that's asking a lot. But if you can figure out why they would want to change and then you give them a solution, you're more likely to be successful. But the most important thing I do is that I don't make my journey their journey. So, so if, I, if, I, if I have people in front of me who are, I have people in my family who suffer from obesity. I'm an obesity doctor. I know I can help them, but they're not, that's not their path right now. So when I go and I'm around those people, I'm not preaching keto to them. I'm sitting down having a dinner and we're just talking about the relatives who are not there. That's what we do at these, <laughs> these gatherings, right? We just have fun. We talk about things and we don't even talk about this unless they come to me. And I think that for anybody that really wants those people they love to heal, be okay, give them grace, provide information, see where they are. And if they're not ready, that's okay. Because you'll, it's so stressful to try to fix everybody. Once you learn the healing potential of keto and ketopore and carnivore, you just want to heal everybody. And even as a doctor, I became a much better doctor when I stopped trying to fix everybody. I just, I hear people, I hear their thoughts. If they say, I'm not ready to stop smoking, we move on to the next thing. We're not going to sit here and beat up on people because they're not ready. And they're usually not ready because there's tons of things going on in their lives that they're focused on that has nothing to do with what we're talking about. And mm -hmm. so, so I think that's the, the way I approach it. I try to give them information based on their why, but then I allow them to be ready when they're ready. Perfect. I, I definitely agree with that. I think that, and I, I've lived that, you know, my mother, my dad as well. Mm. My dad made huge changes. My mom, we're still working on it, right? So, yeah. And it's yeah. life, right? Like you, you're not going to change something before you're ready. No. Right? The same way that they couldn't get me to do something before I was ready. Right. That's how life works. That's right. right. So I think that one of the, the most important things that I'm getting out of this conversation is that we need to let the individual bring to the table what they have, where they are. And then show them the different pathways and see like what what are you what are you able to do right now? That's right. right Baby so steps. The, in, in the medical on the medical side of this, there are things that they could do. And are they are they looking at them? That's right. Right. And some people jump in like I was a jump in kind of person. Right. Other people don't jump in. They're like a slowly, slowly. Both of them can work. That's right. I, and and it's just looking at what am I trying to accomplish? That's right. And I, I have plenty of patients who have taken years. I've been doing this for 10 years in terms of low carb. And I I, I, I have a couple about a year ago who's been, I, I mean, I delivered their grandkids and literally they finally turned the ship. They just came in. We decided to try the stupid diet you've been talking about, right? <laughs> That's what they said. <laughs> But in that visit, A1C number went from, you know, eight, it had been averaging in the eights, it went down to six something. Blood pressure was normal for the first time. Weight loss had occurred. They both, it was a couple, they both had these tremendous improvements. I guess we'll keep doing that stupid diet. And they, <laughs> they, and they said it wasn't that bad. Like we thought it was going to be hard and it's not easy, but it's not as hard as we thought. So, and, and I know there's very few medicines that will fix so many things at the same time. The blood sugar, the weight, the blood, you know, the, the blood pressure, all these things uh, get better all at once. So it's really an opportunity to heal from things that they weren't even thinking about. It could be their headache that they were having, the upset stomach, the heartburn, 
the aches. They were they were focused on diabetes, and yet all these other things got better. So it's really uh, an opportunity to really restore your body to what it once felt like when you didn't have all these things. So it's really exciting. And I I do want everybody, including our parents, to uh, do these things. But I also don't want to be the guy that shows up at the family events uh, preaching when nobody came to go to church. They came to have family gatherings. So I think as we're, I think we both matured and grew and we kind of had to kind of just sit back and say, okay, I, I'm going to roll with this and again, meet people where they are. That's much healthier than um, us trying to force it down their throat. Absolutely. When we accept how resilient we are because we are. Yes. We can manage a lot and it, it takes a bit of perspective to decide I've been managing it. Am I willing and, and ready to try to change it now? That's and those right. are two different mindsets and we need to be in that mindset if we're going to do something different. I agree. This has been an amazing conversation. I'm really glad that we did this. Uh, do yeah. you want to let people know where they can find you? And we're going to keep it simple um, because my oldest son, I don't know if it's my oldest or youngest, Justin or Brandon, but they said, dad, you need a link tree. So I created a link tree. So if people search Dr. Tony Hampton link tree, or we can share it, they'll see all the things I share, whether it's a speaking engagement or my YouTube channel or podcast. So I really encourage people to check that out and just continue to feed yourself with knowledge and then make your own decision. Yes, we have expertise, myself and Violet, but you're the expert on your own body. So once you've heard our expertise, then you make your own decision based on your individual circumstances. That's perfect. And thank you for joining me. And Wellness Warriors, if you would like to follow Dr. Hampton. I'm going to have a link down below to his link tree. I'm also going to uh, encourage you to check out this video right here. That's going to help you to enjoy a better health by trying keto. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day.